Banjo-Kazooie is one of the best platformers of our time. It's great for both new gamers and old. With that in mind, this game gets my completionist ratings of finish it or complete it. That was a really long time ago. October 28th, 2011 to be exact. The show was still very much in its nascency, practically a newborn. I hadn't even figured out what my own rating system was back then. But even though a lot of things have changed since then, my sentiments about Banjo-Kazooie have not. Well, maybe a little. Welcome to the Completionist New Game Plus, where I continue my crusade to re-complete the first 120 games featured on my show. Today, I'm re-completing Banjo-Kazooie, a game that's near and dear to my heart, but was surprisingly slightly different than how I remembered it to be. That... That might just be my memory going, considering how I'm getting old. Am I getting old? My dude, you have sleep apnea. Of course you're getting old. I mean, that's because I'm... It's because I've gained a lot of weight. Doesn't mean I'm as... Yeah, I'm old. back to Banjo-Kazooie is like coming home to some comfort food. You know it's gonna be good, and it just might make you feel a little bit like a kid again. But now that I've completed it again as a full-blown adult, I realize that there's even more to appreciate about Banjo-Kazooie than I originally thought. This game is a bona fide classic 3D platformer, complete with the collectathon main course and a side of charming whimsy. The premise is your classic case of which wants pretty, bear has pretty, which steals bear, an older brother brother of Bear sets off to the rescue with his platonic bird life partner. Simple, elegant, beautiful, platonic. Banjo-Kazooie feels like a subcultural touchstone, since it seems like everyone who had an N64 also had this game. It's like it was a mail-in rebate or something. This game was so prolific and beloved that it helped make Rare a household name and cemented the 3D platformer genre's place in the halls of gaming. Mario 64 may have gotten that party started, but Banjo kept the beats cranked up until the the cops showed up at 4 a.m. Your Sly Coopers, your Hat and Times, and your ukuleles can all trace back their successes to the humble duo of the bear and the bird. As I've said before, I've come back to this game many times over the years, which was made even easier in 2008 when it was remastered for the Xbox Live Arcade. That's the version I originally completed for the show, and that's the version I've completed this time around as well. The first time I completed Banjo-Kazooie for the show, I had a great time running around the worlds and collecting everything I could get my paws on. Interacting with those world's denizens was always a treat, and unlocking new areas and techniques were great motivators to keep you playing. Besides collecting every single item in the game, there wasn't much to completing Banjo-Kazooie, even when you account for the achievements that they added to the Xbox Live Edition. At the end of the day, the game didn't offer much in the way of rewards, but its endearing nuances and stellar gameplay made it worth the effort. And now, after completing it again for the umpteenth time, I'm genuinely astonished by the new elements I've come to to appreciate. I thought it was a wrap. That's it. I formulated my opinion on Banjo-Kazooie and nothing's gonna change it. I thought I'd never get to see tricks in the shape of real fruit again. It was nothing but generic spheres for me from here on out, but I was wrong. And I think I have an explanation for this phenomenon. See, back when I first did Banjo for the show, I was barely the completionist. I had only completed four games for the show at that point, leaving entire libraries of games as of then unplayed and outside of my immediate consciousness. But now that I've been at this for eight years and have completed over 300 games, I've got so many more games fresh in my memory to compare to Banjo, which is why it's clearer than ever to me how Banjo's influence is all over the place. This game established several elements that would eventually become staples of the 3D platformer genre. For instance, this was one of the first 3D platformers I remember being truly populated with a bunch of memorable characters. Everywhere you turn in Banjo-Kazooie, there are crazy kooks to interact with, making each world feel more alive and real. I mean, as real as anything
Anakin can feel with mumbo jumbo walking around, but you get my point. Nowadays, fun NPCs and 3D platformers go together like peanut butter and chocolate. So much so that if one of these games didn't have a healthy population of cartoon people, players would feel cheated. When I first completed Banjo, these characters were the things that stuck in my mind long after I turned off the game. And for years after too, it's hard to forget something as dope as a witch that speaks exclusively in rhyme. She's great. In fact, all of these characters are still just as enjoyable this time around. But knowing that they blazed a trail for countless other fun characters makes them feel extra special. I also realized that I've been taking something else for granted. The fact that you don't get booted to the hub world each time you complete a mission. This wasn't always the case with these types of games. I know I've already made this comparison, but it's a fair one. Mario 64 is a masterpiece and everything, but once you collect a critical item and are allowed to just keep cruising to the next activity, it's hard to go back to that slow alternative alternative. Sorry, painting enthusiasts. As far as I know, Banjo-Kazooie was the first 3D platformer to implement this kind of uninterrupted gameplay, or at least it was the first one that got enough attention to spread that particular design philosophy among its contemporaries. If it wasn't in Banjo, it might not have been in games like Mario Odyssey. It's a trip to think about, but cool nonetheless. During my most recent time with it, Banjo-Kazooie kept revealing to me how ahead of the curve it's always been, like including puzzles and secrets that link two separate worlds together, and making certain collectibles really matter mechanically. This game has always been the quintessential 3D platformer to me, but now I see just how wide-reaching its influence was. And the only reason why it ever reached so wide is because of the impression it made on its players. It's hard to forget such vibrant locales and funky faces, but now more than ever, I realize just how much Banjo-Kazooie's sound design contributes to its uniqueness. Nothing sounds quite like this game, which is, thanks to in large part, that weird gibberish bing-bong language in which the characters speak. When I first completed the game for the show, I was admittedly somewhat annoyed by this chopped up jibber jabber, but now this shit's my jam. I don't know what happened. All I know is back in the day, it seemed dumb. Now, it seems dumb, which is great. This little dialogue oddity makes each character feel unique even without full on voice acting. Plus it makes me laugh. I'm starting to see the actual fruit pieces again. And of course the music itself is still as great as it's always been. This seriously might be my favorite video game soundtrack of all time. They're the exact same songs as before, but now that I've gotten to know the composer, Grant Kirkhope, better, I'm lucky enough to have a little bit more insight into some of these tracks. This dude claims that that Banjo-Kazooie is one of his favorite games he's ever composed for. And it shows with just how good the music is and how excited he is whenever he talks about it. And now that I know what was going on through his head when he composed some of it, it's like hearing this stuff with new ears. Brand new baby ears, man. So Grant, thank you for taking the time to uh, to talk to me today about Banjo Kazooie. I appreciate it. No, thank you for asking me. It's nice to be asked to talk. So it's, you know, it's nice to get the old bloke out the cupboard now and then, right, to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> what what was the idea behind making kind of the overall tone of Banjo? Dopey is not the right word, but there's kind of this like quirky. That's the word I quirky. use. Quirky. <laughs> so I just had to ask what 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 your inspiration was behind it. I think when I started doing it, I knew that I, that I. I, I, I shouldn't. We were trying to beat Mario 64, right? That was our plan, right? Like we were trying to go for that game. Like we need to beat it. There was no point in me writing that kind of Nintendo poppy jazz because, like, Koji Kondo is fantastic at that, and I'm terrible at that. So <laughs> it would be a disaster. So I thought I need to find something somehow that's going to make it me. I came up with that. Click clock woods, right? I need to write a jolly platform tune with some birds singing along. Make it jolly. I don't know anything I could do with it. I was listening to Danny Elfman on his Beetlejuice track. He had that umpa 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 all over the place, and it gave it that really kind of upbeat tempo that you could still make it quirky and dark if it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So I was like, ooh, this is my little light bulb in my head. So no, because if I got dark chords. I can do an umpa 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 and it doesn't it's not gonna scare the kids, right? You know, not, I mean I felt I felt the characters were oddball. I felt like the music needed to reflect and also the humor in the game was oddball. Like all the team together, we had that kind of oddball Monty Python-esque, if you want to call it, whatever it is, that split adult humor. Yeah. So I think I had to try and get that in the music somehow. The thing about that is you never know, you never know if you manage it, because all you've got to do is the, the dev team that you bounce it off. If you'd have asked the dev team, any of the guys at the time would have probably gone, well, we did our best, we've no idea if it's, you just don't know with those things. It's just one of those things, you know. Grant, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. 
Anytime, Gerard. I'm always happy to talk to you, my friend. Absolutely. Take it easy. Some aspects of Banjo-Kazooie seem exactly the same, though. Completing this game is still just a matter of making your way through the 10 worlds and making sure to pick up every single thing you see along the way. Every Jiggy, every Jinjo, Mumbo Token, and extra honeycomb pieces. Grabbing items that make a difference, like the stuff that transforms you or gives you access to new moves, are always hype. But then there are the things, like the musical notes, which are just there to gate you for the most part. I'm still just as tall of them as I've always have been, and I'm still as understanding of what this game has always been. It's a collectathon, but it's the friends you meet along the way that make it special, or something like that. Especially when you consider just how well these collectibles are distributed within each world, providing just the right balance between challenge and ease for the player, and making your way through those worlds feel smooth and intuitive thanks to the surprisingly good for its time camera, which was only made better by the switch to stick controls in the Xbox Live Arcade version. But yeah, at the end of the day, you're still gonna be collecting a lot of crap because some things never change. But then there's my impression of Rusty Bucket Bay, one of the late game worlds. I used to dread it because of how long it would take me to beat it. Back in the day, it would take double or triple the time of any other world. It was just so empty feeling and samey looking and too spread out and... Uh, no. But this time when I got to Rusty Bucket Bay, I did something different. I used my brain like an adult. Instead of going from one activity to the next willy-nilly, I combed this motherfucker systematically. No stone left unturned. And it turned out to not be that bad. I beat it in my own record time, making me not load the level quite as much. Genuine growth. My being wiser and more experienced helped me enjoy one of my favorite games even more. That's magical. It's kind of cool to know that even when you think you know everything there is to know about something, you can always learn more, which gives me the confidence I need to see for myself what this cereal looks like to present day me. Let's just bite the bullet. Okay, let's just, let's just do this. What the hell? Yo, check the prize, check the prize. What the? Tax forms. Tax forms. Your reward for doing it all in Banjo-Kazooie is the same as it's always been. Not that much. If you're diligent about hunting down all the musical notes, you'll unlock a double-sized life bar to help you out in the final fight. At least Banjo-Kazooie does include some fun cheat codes of both the game-breaking and harmless fun varieties. But despite the lack of juicy rewards, Banjo-Kazooie is still an excellent platformer, even after all these years. And if you're a Banjo veteran, you might be shocked at what new things you'll discover if you give it a revisit. Completing this game is its own reward without a doubt, and I'll for sure be completing it again one day. In my re-completion of Banjo Kazooie, there were 900 notes collected, 100 jiggies rescued, 45 jinjos discovered, 24 extra honeycomb pieces found, 12 achievements unlocked, eight and a half hours of total playtime, and $1,500 that I owe the IRS after filling out those taxes. It's the prize that keeps on giving, I guess. Banjo Kazooie to me, and just for me, I think I can firmly say is perfect. It is what I love about completing games, it's what I love about video games in general, and it's the kind of game that it's always Christmas whenever I open it up to play. It just hits me that hard in the chest, all across the board, I love this game. So, with that in mind guys, I give this game my completionist rating of completed, and just complete it. None of this and finish it stuff or finipede it, complete it. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. A big thank you to Grant Kirko for taking the time today to talk about Banjo-Kazooie and all of its awesomeness. If you want to check out his channel, there's a link to that on screen somewhere or in the description box down below. Shout out to all you guys at Patreon who are all awesome. And we'll see you next week for another brand new episode. Bye.